Thank you, Walter. Colleagues, you have been great all day. Um, just bear with us a little bit more. We just have one more presentation and a very important presentation from Rise Life. And I'm going to ask the, the support panelists if they would come to the podium. Is Richard Henry here? Yes, Richard is there. Ms. Sonia Davidson is going to join us. Mark Nicholson is going to come back. End of the summit. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much. My name is Richard Henry, and I work for Rise Life Management Services. Uh, we are involved with the Betting Gaming and Lotteries Commission in providing uh, responsible gaming services. Um, we look at responsible gaming from three perspectives as prevention, treatment, as well as research. But I just want to go back to the analogy that has been made all day about uh, the marriage between, is it Miss Gaming? Yeah. Right, and Mr. Law. And we consider ourselves as the last child from that, from that union. And we have no problem with that. There are certain, yeah, the wash belly. There are certain benefits to being in the wash belly. Um, one of the things for sure, though, is that we are relentless in what we're doing. Uh, at about lunchtime, um, Jana came to me and said, well, we're moving you to the last presentation. Uh, I didn't say it to her, but I said in my head, well, you could move me to the Sunday. We have been doing what we do for the last eight years. So eight years, eight months, 29 days, 11 hours. We have been waiting to be able to do this. So we have been working hard in the field trying to promote the idea of responsible gaming. Some people have been receptive to us, some people have not. But that's fine, and those of you who have called relentlessly trying to get in to do training, know my personality, and know that there's a goal that we have in mind. And the fact that we are here now, I'm sorry that my executive director is away, um, this is sort of for us the crowning of all the work that we've done over the last eight to nine years. And so we're very pleased to be here and see that the responsible gaming notion is now on the national agenda. Okay. So just quickly, some quick objectives. I don't think I can be as extensive as I wanted to be. Not that the presentation was long, but um, I just want to help you to understand more about RISE and what it is that we do under this project with the BGLC. And RISE stands for Reaching Individuals Through Skills and Education. I want to create for you a greater level of awareness and understanding of gambling disorders, create for you an understanding of responsible gaming and its significance to the growth of the industry. Just sitting here throughout the day and hearing how expansive the industry can get tells me even more how important it is for responsible gaming to travel right alongside all that expansion. And I, and I start off by saying once you increase the opportunities for people to game and gamble, you are most naturally going to increase the numbers of people who will discover that they have a problem with gambling. Nowhere in the world do you have, in, in most advanced jurisdictions, advanced gaming jurisdictions, you have responsible gaming going hand in hand with the expansion of the industry. As a matter of fact, and you'll see on some of the slides, in most countries in Europe, United States, you can't apply for a license for a casino without demonstrating in your proposal how you're going to treat with responsible gaming. Okay, and you have to go through the United States, the American Gaming Association. So it's taken very serious, not just a buzzword. So the truth is, I have to use this situation to congratulate the Betting Gaming and Lotteries Commission for being so proactive almost nine years ago and deciding that we need to put in a program that will support persons who will develop issues with gambling while we expand the industry. So there's a picture of RISE, 57 East Street, 
Uh, and just quickly a little bit about RISE. We've been working with this project. We've been working in the field of prevention, treatment, and research for the past eight years. Our prevention program takes us into primary schools. Uh, we engage young people in the ages of uh, 10 to 12 in our gambling prevention lesson plans. And so we've developed these lesson plans to help educate young people who now live in an era where there's the most legalized gambling ever. You agree? So young people need to have more knowledge to be able to make better decisions. So we don't hide information from them. We talk to them about probability. We talk to them about some of the adverts they're hearing. We talk to them about grandma asking you to go and buy the lotto and how we can negotiate that. So it's more about educating young people. We have our poster competition, which is in its seventh year. Proud to say that this poster competition is sponsored by Supreme Ventures. Thank you very much. Why is everybody laughing? The poster competition is about helping young people to understand the ills of underage gambling. And it is always done very well. It's part of our program to be able to help young people to make better decisions, to have more information about what happens if you start gambling and you're not of age. And there are lots of consequences that come with that. Uh, we do training with gaming lounge staff, um, understanding gambling disorders as well as responsible gaming principles. And again, Supreme Ventures was the first gaming lounge that allowed us to come in and do that. So hats again off to Supreme Ventures. But also to Treasure Hunt Gaming, who in terms of a policy for responsible gaming has taken it a little further and we have done the same amount of training with them as well as developed a policy for responsible gaming, which includes a voluntary exclusion program, which I'll talk about uh, in a minute here. So we can give a round of applause to Treasure Hunt as well. We engage guidance counselors and peer educators in understanding gambling related issues and how to intervene with students and peers. We did the first study, or the only study that we know of in the English speaking Caribbean, the Jamaica Child and Adolescent Gambling Survey 2007. It's on our website if you want to see it. And it told us that one in five young people were at risk for or had a problem with gambling. And that's a very high number, probably on par with what obtains internationally. But it told us that we need to do more work in the area of prevention. So that is why we started doing the training with guidance counselors and peer educators. So the, the handbook that I said we developed with the lesson plans, we've taught that to guidance counselors island-wide. And they go into the classrooms and teach young people again. This is not about not gambling. This is about underage gambling because we, have, we don't control what young people are going to do when they're 18, okay? And RISE doesn't have a position against gambling. We're far from that, we're not stupid. Gambling has always existed, will always continue to exist, but we know that as we advance the industry, we have to move along with the services that are the requisite ones. We provide treatment for persons with gambling disorders. Oh, what happened? Oh, sorry about that. So we provide treatment for persons with gambling disorders. We also work with Gamblers Anonymous uh, in trying to provide counseling services. And I can tell you, just from where I stand, that since we have increased and expanded the gaming industry, we've had clients who come in who have developed problems as a result of being in gaming lounges. This is not about not having gaming lounges, but just an example that there are people who are going to develop issues. I've also had clients who work in gaming lounges as well. They will not be named, but I'm trying to highlight the importance of having a responsible gaming program. We assist, well, we assist gaming launches with development of responsible gaming policies, like we did with Treasure Hunt. We advocate where possible and initiate research with regard to game, gambling related issues, and I have something very special I want to talk about. Um, we consult reputable peer reviewed research. And this has ensured our responsible gaming approach is both measured and effective. So we're not looking at fly-by-night theories. Um, thanks again to Supreme Ventures. They have sponsored me for the past eight years to attend the National Center on Responsible Gaming annual conference, where all the who's who in the field of uh, responsible gaming, professors, lawyers, doctors are there giving their presentation. So we've had first-hand experience and knowledge about what to bring back to Jamaica to be able to implement and help in the industry. Um, actually, 
the Jamaica Child and Adolescent Gambling Survey 2007, we took that to the conference in 2008, and we won. For the best research that was presented, and I can tell you research was presented from Switzerland, China, Europe, United States, and we beat them all. That research was done by Hope Enterprises, now Hope Caribbean. So gambling always was, oh, I keep doing that, sorry. Gambling always was and will be an important part of history, tell me when I'm wrong, and a prevailing form of entertainment for the rich and poor alike. Gambling has become increasingly legitimate and socially acceptable, you agree? Now, when I'm talking about responsible gaming, I want to make it very clear that RISE understands from the data that most people who game do not have a problem. Okay? The data shows us that internationally 1% to 4% of people worldwide are estimated to be experiencing gambling-related problems. Okay? And I have a problem when we go and do presentations for church groups because they don't agree with that. But those are the facts. Most people don't have a problem. But even in saying that, the 1% to 4% is very significant because for every one person that has an addiction to gambling, there are at least 10 family members that are affected. So if you do the math, it starts to expand. And most importantly, there are lots of children that get affected by parents who have gambling-related issues. Another significant fact is that 10% of people with gambling problems present for help. So it means that 88 to 90% of people are not getting help. The same sort of obtains in the field of substance abuse as well. And that's important. How are we going to reach those people? Because we know the effects of addiction on the family, on the community, on the society as, on a whole. So like I said before, the vast majority of persons who game or gamble do not exhibit signs of a gambling disorder. Um, it is important for us to keep in mind that most people can gamble for fun, some win, some lose, and, so, and they have a good time. But for some people, gambling becomes a, an addiction as devastating as any drug or alcohol addiction. And I brought this slide because I thought it was important. Um, there, had been some, there have been some important changes to what we call the Bible of Psychiatry, the Bible of Psychology. It's the, Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the DSM. So there's now a DSM-5. For the first time in the DSM-5, uh, the disorder of gambling has been moved from an impulse control disorder, which is one primarily where doctors would give medication. It is now been hosted under substance-related and addiction disorders, which is a significant move, the recognition that there is under addiction, such a disease as a gambling disorder. A couple of times today we've been mentioning problem gambling and pathological gambling. I'll show you on a couple of slides here that that doesn't exist anymore. They have taken away pathological gambling and problem gambling, and we, we now talk about uh, mild, moderate, severe in terms of the levels, and there are now nine instead of ten criteria. And I'll bring that up and show you really quickly as well. Why I have this up here, dopamine, 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 is that Again, I want to reinforce the idea that there is something called a gambling disorder. And that neuroimaging studies have shown us that the same sort of uh, operations in the brain, brain circuitry takes place for people who have gambling disorders as compared to people who are substance abusers. So there's a part in the brain that is called the pleasure center, the reward center. And in most addictions, the chemical, the neurotransmitter that is involved is called dopamine, okay? And studies have shown us that dopamine is one of the uh, neurotransmitters that has been really involved and all is involved in the whole addiction field. So dopamine is sort of a feel-good um, neurotransmitter. And that we're talking about people and addiction is, this addiction is not a substance addiction. It is a process addiction, a behavioral addiction. Because you're not taking gambling, are you? It's an activity, okay? So even with the activity of gambling, we still see in neuroimaging studies the same sort of activity as you would see if somebody is using a substance in terms of the release of dopamine, okay? We don't have enough time to go in depth into that as well. So the, the DSM-5 
has now clearly established that there is a disease of addiction. The gambling disorder is now located in the substance related and addiction section, which is very important. That is real progress for us. So here's the criteria. I'm not going to be able to go through them, but the criteria have changed. So there are now nine. You just saw four there. <laughs> Person needs to gamble with increasing amounts. Is restless or irritable when trying to cut down. Has repeated unsuccessful efforts to control. Is often preoccupied with gambling. Often gambles when feeling distressed. After losing money, um, gambling often returns to do what? Chasing, very important concept. Trying to win back the money that is already lost. Okay? Uh, number seven says, lies to conceal the extent of involvement with gambling. Has jeopardized or lost significant relationships. Um, relies on others to provide money to relieve. And this is generally what is called a bailout. Okay? And I'll give you a very clear example of that. So here are the new criteria they're talking about. This used to be uh, problem gambling as opposed to pathological gambling. Now we're talking about four to five criteria met. It's mild, moderate, six to seven, severe, eight to nine. Okay, it's gonna take us a while to start practicing these, but we'll actually, we'll get there. I wanna introduce you to this guy. His name is Joe Gambler. Not his real name, obviously. This is a client of mine, former client. So he's Joe Gambler, he stole $8 million. Um, from a financial institution, because he had access to accounts. He's a 35 year old male, lives at home with his parents, has a gambling history of 10 years. He's diagnosed with a psychiatric condition, um, obsessive control disorder with intrusive thoughts. He feels less com discomfort with his OCD when he's gambling, so he gambles to release stress. He has worked for one of the most prominent banks in Jamaica. Had access to the accounts where he drew six million dollars, not his money, which he did spend in local gaming lounges. These are facts, okay? Given his family status and connections, he was put on probation and the sum paid back by his elderly parents. Bailout. Two years later, he fraudulently acquires two million dollars at another job. He was commissioned to sell goods and took the cash. Instead of turning it over to the company, he went and gambled again local gaming lounges. Um, two months later, he, creates a, he gets another job. He creates a fake purchase order, gets 75, to, well, the money's going down now, right? So for a company, he's employed, caught, and fired. Again, here, the plan was to sell goods, gamble with the money, and make enough to pay off the supplier before the company realized. His four brothers don't talk to him anymore. There's conflict between the family members, who were once close. His parents have used their retirement money to bail Joe out, so their future looks bleak. And finally, Joe Gambler left in January 2014 for a treatment center as he requires residential treatment. Okay? And this was one client that I used as an example. Remember, we're still just talking about a 1 to 4%. Okay? So we're not talking about a large group, but a significant group nonetheless. So again, science has been able to establish that there is such a thing as a gambling disorder and that addiction is a disease. It's now in the DSM-5. Persons with a gambling disorder have issues with cognition and thinking. So the problem is people with a gambling disorder think they have a special ability to beat a game of chance. And I mean, some of you will identify too in the gaming lounges with people who come with superstitions. So they bring oil, gungu peas, Name some. What else? Put oil on the money. Garlic. Okay? Because they have made some connection with bringing this stuff in and winning at roulette, whatever it is. My client, Mr. Joe Gambler, his special thing was he didn't take a bath if he was going to the gaming lounge. Why not? It would wash off the luck. Okay? So... I'm trying to highlight for you the idea that there is such a thing as a gambling disorder and being an addiction, it is highly what? Irrational. People who have addictions do not think as quote-unquote normal people do. They do things that are abnormal and that is abnormal behavior. Okay? I'm not going to be able to go through all these slides. This is just some of the impacts of 
disordered gambling, and that if we don't have a responsible gaming program, these are the areas that is going to affect work, study, personal lives, financial, the legal system, interpersonal, and community services. Some reasons for disordered gambling. Escape from problems, from day-to-day -day problems. Importantly, some of psychological and psychiatric problems, such as depression or anxiety, which may lead them to gamble as a coping strategy. So when we do an intake at RISE, one of the things that we do is always talk to people about their psychiatric history because there's a very high correlation between people who have gambling disorders and psychiatric conditions, as well as there's a very high correlation between people who have gambling disorders and substance abuse issues, in particular, alcohol use, okay? So we have to do all of that at intake. Always there's something called the first big win, which remains with people, but they can't forget even though it happened 10 years ago, but it is what in the field of addiction we call euphoric recall, which is your mind's ability to only remember the good things. Okay? So despite all these negatives that are taking place, so I had a client, real client again, 45, master's degree, I uh, have to be very careful, don't give him away, uh, lost the family, house, car, wife gone, comes to me for counseling. When he leaves, I have to give him bus fare. Instead of using the bus fare to go home, he gets to the top of the road and he goes and buys cash pot. Again, we're talking about what? Problems with con cognition and how people think. Yeah? There are three groups that are identified as being most vulnerable to developing a problem with gambling. Youth, the elderly, and gaming lounge slash casino workers because of the environment within which they're working. Now, this is not saying all of them are going to develop problems, but because science has identified that it is important that we train these people to be able to understand the environment that they're working in and to pick up signs of having a problem with gambling. And that is why the whole idea of a policy for gaming lounges, and it's a policy that the gaming lounge would have, how do you treat with the staff members that you have? Can they game at your facility? Do you force them to go and game elsewhere? Now, if they game at your facility, it's much easier for them after work to jump right into the addiction. If you force them to have to go somewhere else, there's a period of time within which they might begin to think about, well, I have to travel half the way across town to go and do this. Maybe I'm just going to go home. Okay? The elderly is also very important. Um, I'll talk about that when, we, when I tell you about study that we want to do. So I'm now at Responsible Gaming. I'm going really fast now. Sorry. This is your crash course. What I'm doing here should have been done in probably a day. And I'm going to do it in 25 minutes. <laughs> so Responsible Gaming describes, let's listen to this, a situation where all stakeholders within the gaming industry uphold agreed upon principles and standards that ensure safe and fair gaming experiences that protect customers and the wider society from the possible adverse effects of disordered gambling. Responsible gaming in a regulated environment exists when consumers make informed decisions and can exercise, here's this word again, rational and sensible choices based on their circumstances. Because again, like I was telling you, people who have an issue with gambling usually are not rational and don't make sensible choices, like picking the kids up from school, heading home and passing the gaming loans and decide to stop and leave them in the car and then return to the car five hours later. That has happened here in Jamaica. Not rational, not sensible. True? It means a shared responsibility with collective action by the gaming industry, government, individuals, and communities. The aim is to achieve outcomes that are socially responsible and responsive to community concerns. The principles that govern responsible gaming are grounded in science and driven by collaboration. And it is not more obvious that it is driven by collaboration by the mere fact that we at RISE have had to partner with the Betting Gaming and Lodges Commission who sponsors the program. So without them, we have no program. Then we have to go to Supreme Ventures. They sponsor a piece of what we do. They let us into their facilities. Then we have to go to Treasure Hunt, who again let us into their 
facilities, give us access uh, to voluntary exclusion programs with them, etc. So RISE by itself can't do this. This has to be, as it says, a collaboration with all stakeholders. So why have responsible gaming? Science, again, has established that there is something called a gambling disorder. We live in an era with the most rapid introduction and expansion of legal gambling opportunities that has taken place in Jamaica over the past 20 years. Agree? So it's a new environment. Okay. Is that a sign? All right, I'll speed it up. <laughs> All gaming industry players and stakeholders have a responsibility to customers with regard to engaging in gaming in a safe manner. The industry cannot be hinged just on making money. We are going to get into trouble. There is enough money to be made from gaming as entertainment and fun. When it changes from that, we're going to have issues. Again, remember, we're talking about what? One to four percent. We're not talking about a large group. Okay? but a group that is very important to us nonetheless. Responsible gamblers are better customers than, this again is, why I have responsible gaming? Responsible gamblers are better customers than the person who gambles in a disordered fashion. When the problem becomes bad enough, what happens? You lose the customer, right? So, remember Joe Gambler? Where's Joe Gambler now? Not in the gaming lounges. He took off a treatment, he's out. So Joe Gambler is not our good customer. Our good customer is Michael Gambler, who has a good job, who can afford $5,000 per week to go to the gaming lounge. He likes the environment, the food, the ladies, music, whatever it is. And he can do that every week. Yes, he can do that every week for the month, for the year. And he does that with his friends, and they do that for the next 20 years. That's your customer. Agree? <laughs> Not Joe Gambler, he's gone. I'm, I'm really and truly, he's not on the island. Right. <laughs> okay? He had to go and get treatment. I'm, actually, there were people out trying to kill him because he borrowed money from bookies. Okay? So we lose the customer because what? He has to go to treatment, incarceration, he has to move away. And unfortunately, some disordered gamblers of the severe type commit suicide. We lose the status as a good corporate neighbor, and we also lose sustainability of the companies that we have. It's important to keep in line with what? International best practices and standards. Recent studies point to a decline in worldwide prevalence rates for gambling disorders. This decline is attributed to what? The promotion of responsible gaming principles as part of the growth of the industry. So we're not seeing any more uh, gamblers with severe issues. Why? Because most other jurisdictions are now using responsible gaming practices. And those responsible gaming practices are working their magic inside the casinos. Okay? And I'll show you what some of that looks like. Again, I told you this before, that in other jurisdictions where there's advanced gaming industries, you have to show what? How are you going to deal with prevention and harm reduction of gambling issues? Training for staff, provision of data for research. Provision of brochures and guidelines for responsible gaming. Information about the odds of winning and losing. The possibility of suspending people. Again, a voluntary exclusion program. And training for staff members as well. So what's been happening to date? Well, you remember I told you that I've been waiting, what was it, eight years, eight months, 29 days, 11 hours. Finally, we get a call from the BGLC to develop or partner with them to develop a code of conduct for gaming lounges. How we're going to operate and facilitate responsible gaming. So, I mean, eight years, but I can tell you it was all worth the wait. So we've done that, it's with the BGLC, and then we have to make decisions about how we communicate this to gaming lounges and people participate in the process of what works, what won't work, but certainly we're going to have to have a code of conduct. The code of conduct offers a commitment to employees so how are you going to support employees? It also offers a commitment to minors. How are we going to deal with minors trying to enter? How, how are you going to deal with your customers? Some of whom may have issues with gambling. And it, has, it offers a commitment to the public. Commit, commitment to the public really talks about how are you going to deal with research? 
advertising, and that sort of thing. Voluntary exclusion programs. That goes with the responsible gaming piece, and I had such a treat for you today because I had one of my clients from the voluntary exclusion program come up from St. Elizabeth, and she came into the room and looked at the cameras and saw everybody and said, I'll be back, I'm going to the bathroom. I have not seen her since. No, she probably went back. Yeah, she got a little bit jittery, which is understandable. But I just wanted her, and I gave the story at the think tank. Let me first go back and just tell you what the voluntary exclusion program is. So when someone discovers that they have an issue with gambling, Treasure Hunt, who, have, who has developed a program, they can just go in, talk to somebody at Treasure Hunt, and say, I want to ban myself from coming here. If you ban yourself from Ocho Rios location, you're naturally banned from all other locations. Okay? <laughs> no, it is not treatment. It is an adjunct to treatment. It helps people. So apart from banning yourself, you still have to come to RISE, or we will come to you, and you still have to have counseling sessions. You can ban yourself, and there's a, lead, there's a document that they have to fill out, very comprehensive. <laughs> and the onus of the ban is not on the gaming lounge. The responsibility is put right on the customer. So it has clauses like, if you get in, if you happen to get in, and you game, and you win, you are going to forfeit what you have won. And they sign to that. You can be asked to leave the premises. Now, this is not approved yet. I'm just giving you a heads up of what the voluntary exclusion program is. So the client I was telling you about that went back down, she voluntarily excluded herself. You can take six months, you can take three months, six months, a year, three years, and a lifetime ban. So my client took a lifetime ban. Her friend took six months. Her friend came up with her, she came up with her friend rather, because her friend, for you to get released from the voluntary exclusion, there has to be an interview. Okay? An interview ideally should be conducted with myself and the gaming lounge. But the gaming lounge knew of her coming up to me, so I interviewed her. The person got released for the six months. Um, she had some counseling. Uh, we talked about why it is that you want to go back, etc., etc. And then my client who left today on a lifetime, she said she wanted me to release her from the lifetime. Once you take a lifetime ban, you cannot be released. The mere fact that you thought about banning yourself for life tells me, as a clinician, that there is an issue. So, I shouldn't say I was tempted. I was not tempted. I told her, no way, I am not releasing you. Uh, she went back down. She called me in January, saying that she's so happy that I didn't release the ban, because now her clothing business is up again. She's taking care of her daughter. She has another business venture she's going into, and she has less stress. Okay? Now, I didn't say we didn't work magic, but what we provided her with was an outlet. And this is just one person. The majority of people in your gaming lounges are going to be fine. What we're saying for, these, for this small group of people who need help, that needs to be offered to them, because I can tell you that it works. So the mere fact that she tried to go into Treasure Hunt, and immediately they saw her picture come up and said, you're not allowed. Now, she might have been frustrated for a while, but the end result is her family is better. Her daughter is getting what she needs to get from her. Again, this is 1% to 4%. This is not everybody. Okay? Uh, we had Responsible Gaming Awareness Week last year for the first time ever. Um, it wasn't such on a large scale, but we want to invite more uh, gaming industry people to be involved. This year we plan it for June 29th to July 5th. It is to uh, culminate with the presentation of our Supreme Venture sponsored uh, youth gambling prevention all island poster competition. Okay, so we're trying to make a big to do about it. Uh, what we try to do in this week is do as much training, go into the media, talk about responsible gaming, what gaming lounges are doing, and try and do what? Educate people. We don't tell people no to gambling. When I get into that forum, I get out quickly. Okay? Because we're not, again, we're not silly. It is about educating people to make good choices. A uh, quick picture of, hi Carly, you hear a <laughs> We gave two awards to uh, Treasure Hunt and Supreme Ventures for their work to date in the field of responsible gaming. And those are the first awards that we've given out because we had it for the first time last year. 
and we're hoping to be able to do that again this year. So industry collaboration is crucial. Without it, our responsible gaming activities will be futile. We must share resources and best practices, and perhaps most importantly, by sharing a commitment to responsible gaming, our industry will achieve, I got that, <laughs> enormous progress. I'm not gonna go through ways to keep gambling safe. In your folders, you have a whole left side of rice stuff, so you'll remember rice for a while. On it, we have our 188 number, because we have a telephone hotline where we have trained counselors to man it for us 24 hours a day, where people can call to get information, treatment, and advice on gambling-related issues, okay? So, what's that? Sure, sure. Very quickly, in Jamaica, who gambles more, males or females? This don't look good. Females. Hands up for males. Females. females, hands up. When I saw this question, because this is a question I do with kids in the classroom, and I said, this would be great. You know why? This highlights the need for a study. We have no study on gambling among adults in Jamaica. We can't be expanding the industry and don't have a what? A benchmark. What works, what doesn't, okay? Um, I can't even answer that myself, but if I go by my gaming lounge friends, they're telling me that it's females. But I don't want to do it from an anecdotal perspective. We need to have concrete data. Okay? And that's very important because if it is that there are more females than males, that has implications for our society. Because generally those females are taken care of. <laughs> I didn't say taken care of by the males. Sir. All right, so benefits of a study on gambling among adults. So now I'm, I couldn't come to this platform and not do this. I've been talking about this in our reports to the BGLC for two years. And I, let me just say, the BGLC was the organization that funded the study on gambling, uh, the Jamaica Child and Adolescent Gambling Survey. So we're trying to get them to do <laughs> another one. <laughs> You know what? Forget the study. <laughs> but this is the end. So the benefits of a study will set a benchmark to yield data with regard to increases or decreases in persons gambling. We don't know how many people are gambling. We need to have that all, all that information. Types of games that are popular. So this study is not just about finding out uh, gambling disorders. It's not on the negative side. There are lots of benefits to this study for everybody in the gaming industry. What works, what doesn't work. Um, what areas are, look for growth areas, look like growth areas for us now. So it's something that we all really need to think about. And again, any study on gambling in Jamaica supports responsible gaming. Because it's going to tell us what it is that we need to do to be able to provide more protection for people. So what we say is, know your limit, play within it. And I'm going to leave you with this. Responsible gaming, don't leave it to chance or luck. Responsible gaming, it's the safest bet this industry can make. Thank you. Richard, that was great. Um, we, we, I'm sure there are a few questions. I know time is running, and we just have um, Dr. Um, <coughs> would you, would you want to just come and leave the, the, any question and answers there? Um, I'm sorry, you lot all agree with me that the, that was a very good presentation. Yeah. It's very informative, very comprehensive. The only pity is that it's when half of the people have gone. You know. Um, however, we can entertain a few questions. Yes, he spoke about voluntary and um, that the person was banned from a particular lo location. Were they banned from all gaming location? yeah. locations? Locations? Yeah. I would like to answer that. Yeah. Now, that's where BGLC, we had sent a request asking them to have all gaming lounges on board, which is not in place as yet. Oh, so that person was only banned from that Treasure Hunt place. Gaming. So that's where we would lose profit. Because I can just say, no, I want to go back to Treasure Hunt. So I'll go by Acropolis or something. So 
So we need all gaming lounges to be on board. Truthfully, truthfully though, um, most of the most of the persons that have come into the voluntary exclusion program mm -hmm. have actually not gone to other lounges. They've actually done very well because we track them. Okay. But that's that is the difficulty because in other jurisdictions with the advanced gaming industries, there's a database. Yeah, I know. I'm aware of that. Okay. Uh, the next question is, um, the non-voluntary now, suppose there's a person, for example, when I was at the EGLC, a uh, person called stating that she had lost over $10 million, including mortgage in her house. And her concern wasn't that she lost all of this money. Her concern was that they bar her from coming back so she can win back her money. <laughs> okay? Um, the question, somebody like that, how does a, a, a treasure hunt, a Monte Carlo, deal with somebody like that who is not a voluntary situation? Um, that, hold on, well that, that, that is, that's a very tricky situation because we're starting something new, right? Yeah. So I have to be very careful what we introduce. I can tell you, and you may know, that in other jurisdictions, there are actually people on the floor that are called gaming ambassadors, that are watching people play, and they pick up a lady who has been in the gaming lounge or been in the casino for the past three days. Okay? Hasn't eaten, drank a little water, kept going back to the ATM, and those persons can actually go to that lady and say, um, they won't approach her on the floor and start doing that sort of interaction, but they may ask her, can we have a word with you? Because you don't want to create that sort of discomfort for her. But I know in those jurisdictions you can't actually do that and recommend to people that they actually take a break from gaming. Well, well let me share with you a practical experience. I was in, I was in Bahamas, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the Bahamas um, gaming, gaming um, where they gamble, right? I was in the bathroom and the person showed up in the um, lounge and I heard the security say, is that, like in the is that Wayne from Vegas? I said to him, who is Wayne from Vegas? He said he's banned in Las Vegas and he's banned in all gaming lounges all over the world. And he was able to pick up this guy from the camera and call the security and tell him that he's not allowed to gamble. That is something I wouldn't touch on. So I'm aware of <coughs> that situation. And I know in Jamaica we love that technology and we're not there anymore. Um, uh, if I could yeah, go ahead, go ahead. if I could say something here. Um, exactly what Richard described we have had to deal with in our gaming lounges where you see a particular behavior and you have to pull that person aside, you know, and have that one-on-one -on -one conversation. Maybe you need to take a break for three months, six months, whatever. Um, offer the services of RISE if they want to go there. But if not, you have to take that one-on-one -on -one approach with the person, not embarrass them, but pull aside and make that suggestion. Maybe you need to take a break and, you know, do something. Okay, thank you. Sir. Thank you for that question. Any more questions? How oh, many machines that Trevor Hunt has at Cayman Spa? <laughs> <laughs> well, we have a good machine. It's called the K60. And we have a program created by our gym in uh, Montego Bay that's called KYC. That's Know Your Customer. So, in that regard, when you're registered and you're there, we can track every penny that is spent. We have um, managers on the floor that will man to see how you're gaming, and in that manner they can um, communicate and saying, you know what, this person really needs to take a break. And we won't take no for an answer. We will tell you if you have to go for a certain and period amount of time and come back. So we'll try and get that for you at the game, <laughs> <laughs> Any Any other questions? <laughs> what you will be refunded with is your life. So as, as my client that came today told me, her life is much better. We can't offer anything else, we just can offer the fact that uh, you won't be stressed out, you won't be always broke, and that you have realized that you fall into that one to four percent, and that for you, gaming is not the thing. And it will improve the family too. <laughs>